So, thanks ever so much for joining us. Thanks to Adam. Thanks for my colleague Janet. Hi, Janet. Furiously reaching for the mute button. Yeah. Hi, Greg, how are you? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Not too bad at all. And of course, thanks to Steve for offering um, your time up from the US. In fact, all three of you being in the US, I'm the only UK representative. A little bit embarrassing. Could be something to do with the time of day. So thanks ever so much for coming along. I've got a couple of questions that I've come up with here. But obviously, Janet, please feel free to wade in. And also, Adam and Steve, if, if, there's, you know, if there's something that you were really hoping to get across, that I'm not giving you the opportunity to do because that's not the way my questions are going. Please feel free to just ask your own question and answer it. You know, you I've asked you to come along to this because you're closer to this space than I am. You're more experienced and more recent in this space than I am. So feel free, free to, to take those reins. Um, I've just had a message from one guy from Bob who's saying he's watching it on YouTube because his firewall's blocking him getting into the hangout. So. Bob, there's probably going to be a few seconds delay, but but thanks for, thanks for sticking with us and thanks for looking at us somehow. And if you've got any questions, Bob, feel free to drop them into the, the messaging app just as you have done then, and I'll feel free to bring them up. So although you're not in this hangout with us, feel free to contribute. So I've got a couple of questions, Steve, if I can, if I may start us off. Here we absolutely, go. Absolutely. One of the objects that we look in in this MOOC is a history of wearables. And I think it kind of shakes us up and makes us think wearables are actually nothing new. If we take into account fabric as a wearable piece of technology, if we look at Gore-Tex as a wearable piece of technology, if we think about spectacles and, and hearing aids and pacemakers and things like that, wearable technology has been around for, for decades, hundreds, you might consider thousands of years if we think about wearing furs and things. So why is it in the past three, four, five years, maybe slightly less than that. Why have wearables become such a big thing to talk about when we've been wearing wearable tech for a long time? Is it the Apple effect? Is it the Internet of Things? Is it connectivity? Is it something else? So why do you think, Steve, that we're hearing more about wearables now than we were 5, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's, a, that's a really that's good a really question. question. Um, I've actually um, got a lot of feedback going to make it kind of hard for me to talk. Okay, seems to be gone now. Uh, yeah, really great question. Um, I think there is maybe a little bit of the Apple effect in this past year, but even before then, uh, you know, as the uh, Internet of Things has sort of come online, the kinds of things that you can do with wearable technology has changed a lot. And especially with integration with smartphones and, you know, web services and things like that, uh, what you can do with wearable technology is becoming a bit more accessible, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, where you yeah. can... What was that? Yeah, absolutely makes sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're, I think the value that you're getting with a lot of the newer wearable technology is that it integrates with other things that you might use uh, on a daily basis. It can integrate with your phone uh, or, you know, whatever, you know, Internet of Things kinds of devices you might have maybe in your home. And I think that's kind of why it's taking off. So the Apple effect to a degree, but I guess that what comes packaged with that is, is, is the connectivity, is the fact that we can do so much more with potentially so, so little compared to what we're able to do. And you think that's, that's leading this, this momentum and this is raising the profile of wearables more than what it's done before then. Yeah, definitely. And, and also, you know, just thinking about processing power, I mean, the amount of uh, stuff that something that can sit on your wrist can do is leaps and bounds above what it was, you know, five, ten years ago. So as businesses are sort of taking advantage of that, uh, and, you know, in addition to the integrations they're able to, to kind of do with it, uh, I think that's why they're, they're out there and they're pushing it, they're trying to get people interested, and I think people are really picking it up. So again, I want to I want to try and refer back to something that's a conversation that's been happening in the MOOC just to maintain a sense of, of, of connectivity with it. One of the articles, and I think perhaps it, it may have been one of yours, Steve. You're certainly featured in there, a piece of curated content. But there's, a, there's an article in there that talks about wearables on the spectrum of mobile. Now I know that Flow have been doing remarkable things with mobile and, I, and I'm talking about true mobile not necessarily just shrinking courses down onto a smaller file, uh, smaller 
form factor, but you've been doing some really cool things with mobile for, for quite a few years, and that's how I became aware of you. Do you think it's a prerequisite for organisations to have been through that mobile upbringing, if you like, to have reached maturity with mobile? And by mobile, I'm talking about phones and I'm talking about tablets. Do you think that's a prerequisite for a successful adoption of wearables, or do you think that actually... If you get it right, you can kind of leapfrog that and go straight to a, straight to wearables. And I know that wearables is a very wide and vast term, and it could include all sorts of things. And I'm perhaps intentionally being wide and encompassing just to see what you come back with. Can organisations skip the mobile cycle and get straight to wearables? What do you think? Uh, again, a great question. Um, I don't necessarily see the two as being that different. Um, there are a lot of considerations in terms of form factor and user interface and user experience, but ultimately I think what we've tried to do here at Float uh, with our mobile efforts is to make it so that uh, the, the information that we're providing uh, on a mobile platform is contextual and relevant and uh, you know, takes into account the fact that the that it's mobile, that it can move around, that it could, the user could be doing this anywhere. Uh, and that's, you know, a big departure from, you know, classrooms and, and desktop uh, courses and things like that. So uh, I think that as long as you're kind of applying some of those same principles of uh, flexibility and accessibility and, you know, this sort of mobile mindset, uh, as long as you're applying those same principles to wearables, uh, I don't think that they would be that different. Uh, obviously, you can do different things with wearables, but I think for for an industry perspective, I think a lot of the approaches you might take would be the same. Okay, so for, I guess for the organisations that have that have got that mobile maturity behind them, they might have an extra spring in their step. But actually, it's not necessarily a reason to to put off thinking about a mobile uh, thinking about some form of wearable project just because you don't have it behind you. I guess, you know, it, it's not necessarily going to stop you in your tracks. You might just be slightly behind the curve of those organizations that have got some mobile experience. Yeah, I mean, if you're, uh, if you're interested in wearable technology and you've already sort of made the investment, made the leap to get into mobile technology, yeah, you've absolutely got a leg up. But, you know, if you're, if you're interested in that, you know, you don't... Uh, you don't need to have done the wearable step. You just need to have, the, or, or the mobile step. You don't need that background. Uh, you just need to have, like, kind of the right approach to, to how you're doing it one way or the other. Perfect. Thank you. I think, I think you've won an argument for me in the MOOC. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm using you to fight my battles, but it always helps. So. No, yeah, you can, yeah. Thank you for that insight. I'm really conscious, of course, that we've got Adam and we've got, Janet here as well. Of course, Adam, you, you might really want to put Steve on the spot here and ask you some really tough questions. I'm sure he'll thank you for it. Um, Janet, of course, you know, please feel free to wade in either as a, a follow-on question to anything that Steve said, or indeed if you want to take it in your own direction, please feel free to do so. Don't you know? Don't wait to be asked because I might forget. So just interrupt me. You've mentioned about organisations, Steve. Um, you know, using mobile, using wearables. If you're able to, and, and, I, and I certainly don't want it to feel like you're putting you on the spot or, or, or landing you in it here, but if you're able to, uh, uh, as anonymously as you want, what are your, you know, what sort of exciting things are your clients doing with wearables? Or if you can't share it, what would you really like on a personal level? What sort of project would you really like to sink your teeth into from a wearables perspective? So ideally, what are your clients doing? Anonymized, of course, if you're able to share it, and if you're not, what would you really like to be getting stuck into? Sure. So uh, sort of our big uh, wearable project was, uh, and you can find out more information about this. I, I don't know if you've seen it, but I did a talk a couple weeks ago at uh, Unity's Vision Summit. And the big project there, the big uh, goal there was uh, to provide uh, an interface for people that are, you know, in uh, very critical, very uh, contested environments uh, to provide them with additional information about their surroundings uh, in a seamless, uh, head-mounted, uh, sort of an augmented reality perspective. So that was that's like the, the big thing that we've done. And certainly, it was a huge learning experience for us. I mean, it, it sort of took advantage of uh, a lot of different capabilities in these devices, you know, 
uh, image processing and uh, communicating with the server, getting more uh, data back from a server about you know a vehicle or about some text uh, that you want to uh, translate and things like that. So that that was the big thing, um, and I think uh, generally what we've seen is a trend towards uh, finding out what wearables are good for, what the what they what what they bring to the table more or less, uh, and how we can use that to uh, kind of uh, augment. Uh, the the workforce, uh, how we can make it easier for them to do their jobs in a, in a wearable, uh, using the unique advantages of wearable. Okay, now that, I, I mean completely by accident, but but very very fortuitously, that's kind of a lead-on question that Bob asked a few minutes ago. Bob Schaefer uh, works for Raytheon, and and he's observing this again through Hangouts. Hi, Bob. Uh, Bob's asked a question here that. I think as a, as a distinct parallel with what you said, or might even intersect with it, he said that ambient noise has been a challenge for them when trying to use for technicians. The tools keep getting better. Any thoughts related to ambient noise while using a headset type wearable? So I guess his technicians are getting a real problem with background ambient noise, um, possibly the people at the other end are getting problems with it. Any, any thoughts or insights or experiences with that? Um, that's a good question, and you know, depending on where your workforce is, that can be a big issue. You know, if you're outdoors, you know, there's wind and weather to take care of. Uh, but if you're obviously on sort of a factory kind of uh, like a like on the floor, you know, that can be very noisy. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if if you would have any more insight on this. Whether he's talking about uh, sort of like voice recognition uh, in terms of ambient noise, or in actually like uh, uh, using sound to present information to the user? I don't. I mean, hopefully, he's asked you, he's heard you ask me that very question. So if you're still there, Bob, feel free to update that. So the question from Steve was Is it a case of the ambient noise is blocking out the, um, the, the speech recognition from the person wearing it? I guess the other challenge is is the ambient noise blocking any sort of audio transmission to the wearer and I guess the other aspect if there's somebody at the other end of this device if it's connected with somebody are they having a problem here we go that was quick and um, it's automotive technicians yes it is voice recognition Steve and um, VR versus AR what should a customer focus on for them so I think it bobs up to a couple of questions here I think but it was voice recognition for automotive technicians so I guess they're in a manufacturing environment there's machinery there's conversation um, there's echoes there's the production line taking place yeah so this is not at all just a problem with wearables and uh, Google and Apple are both dumping a ton of money into making this sort of thing better uh, actually, Google posted, uh, to sort of tie it back into your artif artificial intelligence a little bit, they talked, uh, I believe it was a month or so ago, about how they're using uh, convolutional neural networks to improve the results of text or of speech, speech recognition. So uh, actually training uh, a neural network on hundreds or thousands of speech samples and then using that to improve the results uh, in environments with a ton of noise, uh, other people talking, and that sort of thing. Uh, so not, not only have I seen it uh, be an issue, um, certainly in our own testing, uh, but it's, it's something that's addressed at a very high level by these companies that have the resources to kind of sink a ton of time into fixing it, and they're working on it. And if you haven't noticed, uh, speech recognition, uh, especially on Android, I know they're always pushing out updates with, you know, Android 6 made a few changes with this. Uh, they're they're always improving the quality of the speech recognition, uh, and obviously Siri is way better than anything that we had available to us. You know, not that long ago, it's a kind of a big step forward in terms of the ability to uh, recognize speak speech, regardless of the context. So it is a problem. It's not Bob that's it's not just Bob that's facing the problem, but we can rest it here that the uh, the greatest minds on the planet, including you guys at Flow, are obviously thinking about how to overcome it and work around it. Good to hear. Um, one another question I've got here, and I mean we could I guess this I guess this question could take days to answer because I imagine you've heard a lot of them. What's the biggest barrier to wearables, or should I say excuse to not using wearables that you hear coming back from the organizations 
themselves? What what's the biggest pushback that you get? Um, does it be, does it begin with the letter P or is it something else? Uh, I'm guessing you mean price. No, I meant privacy. But yeah, price. <laughs> <could be. laughs> yeah. So uh, absolutely. Um, anytime you're dealing with uh, Internet of Things uh, technology. Uh, Privacy and maintaining user data in a secure and safe way is, is a huge concern. Uh, but I, I'm not even sure, you know, I'm, certainly certain industries are going to be moving into this faster than others. But I think that what we've seen is people are more worried about what are you, how do you benefit by including wearables, right? Because developing something for wearables isn't free, right? You've got to spend time and resources on that. You've got to provide the hardware to uh, you know your your workforce or, or what have you, uh, and that's not free. So there's definitely sort of a value proposition kind of balance going on right now. And it's so early, it's hard to say like, oh, we've seen uh, company X, Y, and Z have done this and they've made you know this much more money. You know that that sort of information just isn't out there yet. Uh, you know Volkswagen has done some stuff with wearables. Uh, the the postal service. Did some stuff uh, with uh, headworn uh, gear and, and uh, sort of sort of an augmented reality thing for package tracking. Uh, a lot of companies are looking into this stuff, but it's it's still really early, and it's hard to say necessarily what you're going to get for the money you spend. On the subject of price, one of the objects that I've got that nobody's seen yet, I've actually got it lined up for next month's level, which is about VR and AR. And what's really interesting about this is is you've already cut across several of these levels. So we know we're talking about wearables now, but you've mentioned AI. We've spoken about VR and AR already. So it, it's I guess what I want people to take away from the MOOC is that none of these are really in isolation. You know, you can start to think about wearables that have got an AI input or an output that are wearable that enable you to tap into a virtual alternate or augmented reality. So I'm, pl I'm pleased you've mentioned that. One of the objects from the next level is the, is the Australian Air Force's F-35 pilot's helmet, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars per helmet, actually allows the pilot to see through the plane. Yeah, because I've seen that. That's very, very cool. Yeah, very cool. And um, I think possibly the most expensive wearable project that I've seen. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I can kind of understand why, but look, it's a, a very, very cool project. Uh, the fact that they can look at their feet and the cameras mounted on the underside of the plane will track their head movement and relay to them what is underneath the plane, despite it being a solid fuselage, is, um, is quite cool and very expensive. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, I'm really conscious of the time. Um, I'm also conscious that I've got one or two questions left lined up, but I'm conscious that Janet or indeed Adam, uh, Janet might want to ask a question. Adam, you might want to bring something up from your perspective. So just want to give a few moments to see if Adam or Janet want to open their mics up. Janet, I know you're keen on, on data and analyzing data and, and, and tracking performance through that. So if there's anything in that field that you, um, you want to sort of address, please feel free to put Steve on the spot. Well, you know, I was actually thinking about something that was was kind of off track from my usual data world, which was when you were talking about the uh, the uh, Air Force helmet, and that started making me think about uh, what are some of the applications you're seeing uh, with wearables that might help with accessibility issues? Are you seeing anything interesting with that? That's a good question, and uh, there there are definitely some very exciting things on the way. Uh, accessibility is a huge concern, and one of the interesting things about wearables is that uh, traditionally we've had these very, uh, well, not, you know, not traditionally, it's only been a, a few years really, but we've had these devices that are very hard to interact with if you are visually impaired, uh, and Apple and Google have both done a lot of work to make the devices as accessible as possible, but it doesn't change the fact that if you can't see what's going on on the screen, it's a flat glass panel. Uh, and that leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, I think with uh, wearables, uh, we're moving almost away from that form factor to maybe something that's more uh, conversational, uh, and that's actually something that's been a huge subject of research. Again, with you know the idea that you can ask Siri to do something for you, that's much more accessible for somebody who's maybe visually impaired than uh, something where you're actually inter interacting with a, a, a UI on a, on a flat display. 
Um, of course, that's not the only uh, kind of accessibility concern you might have, um, but it does offer some alternative uh, uh, interaction mechanisms, as it were, uh, as opposed to what has been uh, the predominant factor for, for a few years now. One of the um, one of the objects again that I've I think I might have culled it from the course actually because there's only so much you can put in there. But I've seen an example whereby there was a there was kind of a gauntlet. I mean it was a, it was a grotesque looking thing. It was all sorts of wires, but I guess it's an early prototype. But it allowed people to let me get this right to hear sign language. Oh, that's really so, cool. So when somebody was signing, it actually. I have zero idea how it happens. That's why I do the job I do. <laughs> but it, it actually, you know, I guess it was picking up on motion or tendons moving in the arms or digits moving, but it was able to allow people to hear sign language, which I thought was just mind blowing. If I can find that link, and it'd be quite easy to do, I'll make sure I share it on Twitter afterwards for you to take a look at, Steve. Yeah, I'd be super interested to see that. There's uh, there have been a few projects like that. There's actually another one where somebody was doing some object recognition and, and tracking. They would wear a few markers on their fingers, and they'd have a camera uh, basically on their chest, and they would be able to track their motion of their fingers, and they could use that to sort of turn sign language into text. Right. Right. It, it's just amazing. So hopefully there's, there's some accessibility ideas there rattling about, Janet, I hope. Um, I've got one question from Bob, and then I'm going to ask my question, and I'll probably start to wrap it up. Bob asked two questions. It was a double barrel question. One was around VR virtual reality versus AR augmented reality and I guess what Bob's forced me to do is to preempt next month's less, less level which is about AR and VR but as we've already said trying to sort of differentiate these things out and put them into very specific silos is almost impossible and I don't think a particularly healthy thing to do so VR and AR Bob, Bob I guess will know what the difference is between the two but do you see any you know do you see your clients airing towards one or the other? Is there one that's better than the other? Or is it, as my gut tells me, it completely depends what they're hoping to achieve from it will de de determine what best medium is? Sure. So uh, we've obviously, uh, in, in the project that I was mentioning earlier, that was a, a very large uh, AR uh, sort of project. Uh, and we're sort of dabbling with VR right now, nothing, uh, nothing to show. But uh, I think the, the big difference is with augmented reality, you can really deploy that to, to, to your workforce in the field. They can use that to get additional information in the field. But you can't really do that with virtual reality. Uh, virtual reality, though, I think has a lot of interesting uh, applications because you can simulate just about anything. Uh, you, you have some limitations, you know, uh, uh, the HTC Vive has this concept of room scale VR where you can actually move around a small area and you, you know, you're limited somewhat in where you can go, but it, it picks up your motion and it, it can track your controllers, which could be your hands uh, in this space. Uh, that sort of thing could be really useful for training someone how to maybe perform a repair on an engine or use uh, a piece of equipment that is sort of complicated but has like, you know, some knobs and dials and stuff, stuff that they can see in this virtual environment that might be very expensive for them to mess with uh, in, the, in the real world. So in terms of training someone ahead of time, I think virtual reality is going to offer a lot more fidelity than you would see with maybe a desktop-based application. Uh, and, and especially because NASA uh, did a really interesting talk a little while ago where they talk, talked about uh, the ability of people to perform spatial recognition tasks in virtual reality as opposed to on a desktop computer. And they did much, much better, like way better than you would think uh, on these spatial recognition tasks when they had virtual reality as opposed to when they were interacting with a flat display. Uh, and the, the difference was not small at all. It was, it was night and day. So if you can leverage that somehow in your training or maybe even uh, it's sort of a conceptual phase if you're an architect or you're building something you want to be able to see what it looks like. Uh, I think that's going to be a huge benefit. Whereas augmented reality, just to kind of juxtapose it, is more of a, maybe an end of the field kind of augmenting your workforce uh, kind of thing. 
you, the point you made there, thank you, Steve. You, you mentioned about NASA there, and it caused again. I, I'm giving away the next level now. Nobody's going to bother come and doing it. But there's, a, there's an example in there of um, we've got a guy in space at the moment floating around up there, a guy called Major Tim Peake, um, and he, there's an object where he was training, and he's ground training, training to do the space flight rescue simulator but again using VR so it just it just triggered me to think oh yeah we've got an example in the next level of the MOOC with um, you know the, those guys and gals floating around up there using VR for their training and I guess the people that are responsible for training them don't do things in half measures and, and kind of don't cut corners so I guess there's some research gone into was that the best way of, of training them. There's another object that's in there something you said right at the beginning about being able to put people into almost any environment there's one use case I've seen of it, and you, you've probably seen this, Chris, but it's a TED talk by a guy called Chris Milk. And he's talking about VR being the ultimate empathy machine. And he talks about some projects that are not that are, that are not about complex, dangerous type activities, not they're not about you know sort of motor um, motor type skills, like motor skills. They were about letting people understand about the state of refugees and about famine and about these sorts of environments that we can see on the TV um, and we can read about and we can hear about and of course it never quite puts you in that, it doesn't make you feel hungry although maybe it will get to that stage but he spoke about it, it they actually took it to the UN and allowed you know several of these incredibly important UN people to put these headsets on and, and gain a real feeling of empathy for these these people that were in this disparate, almost alien type environment, and it did make me think that you know VR, yes, it's good for allowing people to 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 practice and hone their motor skills, but there's also something I, I think particularly to tap into from an empathy and a, and a, a, a processing perspective that 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 maybe isn't the obvious use of VR, but it's probably a simpler use of VR because it's maybe just about immersion rather than tacit skills. Yeah, I think we're just starting to see the, the real benefits of high-end VR. You know, it, this is not the first time VR has come around, but I think it's the first time where we've got the technology and people have put the thought into how it's going to be uh, implemented so that the hardware can support, you know, very innovative concepts. Like, like you're saying, like teaching somebody empathy in VR, you need, I think, a lot of uh, versimilitude in, in, in the uh, level of detail of the uh, simulation in order for that to work. So I, I, I am absolutely excited to see what people do with, with it. And, you know, this stuff is coming on the market. This will be available to consumers here in the just the next few weeks. We've got the, the Vive and the, the Oculus Rift coming out. So uh, expect to see a lot of growth in this, this field very, very quickly. My final question, if I may, Stephen, and, and uh, of course I'm still going to offer it out to, to anybody that's looking on YouTube and Janet and Adam, but, but my final question, unless your response prompts another one, we've talked about some, some crazy AI, uh, some crazy wearable projects. We've talked about the Australian Air Force and their multi-hundred millions of dollars for a helmet. We've spoken about putting people into space and training them for that. We've talk, spoken about allowing the UN to gain an nth of an insight into... into the, the the refugee crisis within the world. I want to I want to bring all that back down to a really fine point now, and I guess a really typical end user pragmatic perspective. I've worked in some quite risk averse, cautious, conservative type of, of organisations where the sheer conversation that we're having now would have the IT security manager chasing you with a, with a burning stake and a pitchfork and things like that. I've also worked in some organisations whereby I've been able to, to get things moving by adopting a very small gorilla, as, as Jeff said, was there, a small gorilla type of approach. I worked in one organisation moons ago where we started to get wearables into people's way of thinking by simply setting up some, some monthly competitions on, and Janet's going to grin here, on people's step activity, and she's going to grin because we're doing it in HT2 at the moment. We didn't splash out on the wearables, we didn't invest in them, we invested in the, the infrastructure to allow people to record their data, and we invested in some prizes and some recognition, but actually all the hard work was being done by the end users themselves, it was their physical activity tracker, 
we weren't that bothered about the accuracy of it to be perfectly honest because I worked for a healthcare provider so it was all about just generating some thought in people about how can they subtly change their habits and hopefully our clients to lead a more physically active lifestyle so is there any advice that you would give anybody that's watching this live or recording of this that, that loves the big ideas but actually they're starting right here on day one are there any tips that you could give people to, to, to allow them or their team or their department or their business to just start to dip their toes in the water of wearables? Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously going to depend a lot on the company and the context, but, you know, maybe if, if you're interested in this sort of thing, go out there and, you know, buy a device, get like a Fitbit or an, you know, an Apple Watch and kind of see how that shapes your behavior. Uh, I think that the, one of the really interesting things about wearables is they make you a little bit more aware of things that maybe you wouldn't think about. They can help to amplify things like, you know, the Apple Watch telling you to stand up every half hour or whatever, you know, tracking your steps throughout the day can help you lead a more active and health, healthy lifestyle and maybe that's what you're going for in your wearables push. Uh, you know, try it out. See, does that actually work for you? Do you think that there's value in that? And you can kind of think, you know, definitely if you're working in the health industry, what are we getting out of this? What's the, the value that we're getting out? And how much is that going to cost to put it in, into place? Uh, and if, you're, you're, if you have the hands-on experience, you're going to have a much better idea, I think, of uh, how to move forward. And not too long ago, again, that, that wasn't really feasible. You couldn't just go out and buy a wearable device. But now they're everywhere. It's, it's almost hard to avoid them. So uh, I would absolutely say, I, I think, you know, maybe even smaller than a guerrilla project, maybe one or two people just trying something out and seeing if they think it's worthwhile to move forward with it, I think is, is absolutely a good way to go. Start small, think big, move fast. Yeah. Or as fast as you can. Steve, I promise no more questions from me, but of course I'm going to open it up to, to Adam in case he's got any observations from his perspective. Janet, if you've got any further questions, whether they relate to your particular field um, or not, and anybody that's watching on YouTube, um, if, feel free to, to drop any last questions in. We've got a few minutes to keep the pressure on Steve and keep him under that spotlight, so um, over to you guys. If there isn't, then I'll give it a couple of moments and, and we'll thank Steve and, and carry on with his working day. So, Adam. YouTube, Janet, over to you. I have no questions. Uh, I work with Steve, so um, it's nice to hear kind of a different perspective that you don't get to hear, you know, in the office every day. Um, you know, you asking these questions, Craig and, and Janet and Bob, so thank you guys for that. Thank you, Adam. And again, you know, there the, the weren't quite as many people attended this as I'd expected, but what I have found is that once I've wrapped the recording up and stuck it on YouTube, it just tends to get hit, so I guess it, it just falls at a bad time. They're either working or they've finished working, um, but I'm going to make sure that this is certainly added to the collection yeah. of material Luke is providing. Uh, and of course, it will all be getting back linked back to your good sales at Float as well. So, so and again, from me to you, Adam, for helping to set this up in the background, huge thanks. And uh, please pass my thanks on to, to whoever sort of approved and say hello to Chad, and I still owe him that beer. Yeah, <laughs> I was wondering last week, I was like, ah, oh, did you guys meet up for that beer? I didn't know, but uh, yeah, I'll let them know. Yeah, thank you. And over to yourself, Janet, any closing questions or comments? No, nope, she's not. She's shaking her head there, so nothing. Let me just have a quick check on YouTube. No questions as such. Some observations by Bob, but no specific questions, and I'm very mindful of your time, Stephen Adams. So, on that note... Again, a, a huge thanks from me personally, from everybody at HT2, from from Ben and the guys there. A huge thank you. Um, you know, getting the insight from you guys that, are, that have done this and are doing this and with bells and whistles on it is incredibly valuable. And again, the fact that we've touched on AI and VR and AR that we've not actually discussed yet in the MOOC means that I can I can refer back to this um, once we start to reach those levels. So again, from this side of the pond to that side of the pond. Adam, Bob on YouTube, Janet and Steve, a huge thank you from your cousins across the water. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much.